You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Yes, indeed. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Goku. Uh, here today with another paper that should be interesting, Sheikh Anta Jope's Two Cradle Theory. Before we get into the paper, I'd like to remind you guys that this show is a part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. There are other shows in the network I would suggest um, you guys check out. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Also, make sure you check out the Queen's Council podcast, which is also part of the KWAZ family. I see in the chat room, we got Revolutionary Matron. I had a good conversation with a group of folks that included Revolutionary Matron last Saturday night after the live stream on the Discord. If you look down in the description of this episode or at the pinned comment in the chat, you'll see the link where you could join the Discord. Make sure to join the Discord come through, commune with us, build with us, and work with us, right? Uh, So yeah, click the link, join the Discord today. Uh, Revolutionary Matron, uh, I also had a a separate conversation with her, uh, really liked the sister, and I hope to see some positive things from her in the future. Thank you for being here tonight, Revolutionary matron i appreciate you so this paper shake onto job's two cradle theory revisited by troy d allen from southern university in louisiana the abstract goes for many scholars the concept of race to discuss for many scholars the concept of race to discuss the ancient egyptians is a modern ideological and social construct that fails to have agency in antiquity Therefore, scholars have attempted to negate the ancient Egyptians' African identity by stating either that race does not exist or that the Egyptians were a race of their own. This article seeks to discuss Sheikh Anta Job's two cradle theory by using historical and linguistic evidence to place ancient Egyptian culture in its proper cultural context. This study examines the quote unquote proto cultures of the three quote-unquote cradles posited by Job, northern, southern, and the zone of confluence. And here you see the keywords, two cradle theory, shake onto Job, matrilineal social structure, comedic civilization. Right? Uh, right. So, so, so here we go. The great African historian, shake onto Job, challenged the dominant narrative of African historiography with the publication of his groundbreaking work, Nations, Negres, et Culture, in 1955. In that work and subsequent texts, Job emphasized his theory that ancient Kemet was an African nation and was connected to the rest of quote-unquote Black Africa. Even as important was even as important was the fact that Job's work demonstrated that ancient Kemet could not have emerged from the quote-unquote proto-cultures of Semitic civilization or Indo-European civilizations. To demonstrate his thesis, Job articulated 
what he called a two cradle theory that illustrated key underlying structures and foundations of African civilization. Then Chilp juxtaposed those characteristics against the similar structures and foundations of Indo-Aryan civilization. The French historian uh, Fernand Braudel, 1993, stated in A History of Civilizations, quote, these realities, these structures are generally ancient and long-lived and always distinctive and original. They, it is that civilizations, their, their essential outline and characteristic quality. Uh, I'm not sure how they how they wrote that but okay job argued that the role of and status of women was one of these underlying realities and structures that gave african civilization its uniqueness right the role and status of women is what gave african civilization its uniqueness in fact Braudel agrees that this is this is an essential criteria to be examined. Braudel states, quote, the role of women is always a structural element in any civilization. A test. It is a long-lived reality, resistant to external pressure and hard to change overnight. A civilization generally refuses to accept a cultural innovation that calls into question one of its own structural elements. This article seeks to discuss Sheikh Anta Job's two cradle theory. Using historical and, and linguistic evidence, we examine what this study characterizes as the proto-cultures of the three quote-unquote cradles posited by Job, northern, southern, and the zone of confluence. In 1908, Edward Wilmot Blyden authored a small text entitled African Life and Customs, in which he stated, Quote, there is no question now as to the human unity, but each section has developed for itself such a system or code of life as its environments have suggested to be improved, but not changed by larger knowledge. The African has developed and organized a system useful to him for all the needs of his life. Biden then set out to describe four aspects of African life, the family, property, social life, and the tribes. He cautions his readers that he is speaking about a particular type of African, that is, one untouched by European or Asiatic influence, namely, as Blyden states, the quote-unquote pagan African. The idea of an African untouched by outside influence is an essential component for Africans who wish to regain an accurate historical memory. It makes sense. It just makes sense, right? Currently, Africa's social organization includes both matrilineal and patrilineal family structures. These varying family structures, in some cases, can be attributed to an indigenous response to a changing environment. Also, there has been a great deal of foreign imposition on the African family and social organization through Christianity and Islam, right? In fact, ancient Kemet provides us with a record of how Africans constructed their society before foreign influences uh, had taken hold in Africa. This type of scholarship can be used as a guide to rebuild African culture and civilization as you guys know we have the project on building a african a pan-african centered curriculum i uh i'm gonna deliver to the discord some materials by tomorrow night maybe saturday morning at the, the latest that will help us in the endeavor right but the point of the uh, curriculum is, 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 is kind of stated in this last statement right here, these last two sentences, right? Ancient Kemet provides us with a record of how Africans constructed their society before the foreign influences, right? This type of scholarship can be used as a guide 
to rebuild African culture and civilization. And that's pretty much what we want to do. Rebuild and improve, modernize, right? African culture and civilization, right? The curriculum can do this. We get the, if we can get the right scholarship in terms of history, uh, you know, do the right research to, to get the right facts, you know, this is what we want to do with uh, the curriculum. To continue, writing during the classical period of Victorian anthropology, Blyden attempted to explain the cultural difference uh, practice by Africans, Europeans, and Semitic peoples without the ethnocentric superiority and racism of his day. Although his attempt was valiant, Blyden was shouted down by an avalanche of material produced by European anthropologists who extolled the virtues of European society and culture under the rubric of progress, enlightenment, consciousness, spirituality, light, and reason. When Sheikh Ante Joe produced his works in the 50s, or the 1950s, he stated, quote, I realized the work I undertook was that of a generation of scholars, end of quote. Sheikh Ante Job's two cradle theory sets out to elaborate on a topic that Blyden had briefly broached a generation earlier. That is, there exists a single origin, right? There exists a single origin, an evolutionary area of humanity. And that humanity developed the differences we cite as culture as a response to the environment and the needs of life. The thrust of Job's work was clearly to dispel any notion of African inferiority, especially in the context of culture. Job states the ideas that were prevalent when he began his work. Uh, quote, at this point in time, sociology was promoting a theory that black culture was inferior to Western culture, inferior in fact to all cultures, even the more advanced sociologists subscribe to this concept. For example, the, 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 the matriarchal family with the spirit of mother dominating was considered inferior to other cultures. So I'll give you a little background about something. The reason I am reading this paper tonight is because the last reading that I did it came up that folks were debunking Sheikh Antijope's work, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, this, the concept that black folks were, you know, Africans were coming to America before Columbus did, right? A couple of people pointed this out that it's been debunked, etc. And I had this question, which I did ask on question of the day in the Discord. Is it, let me see if I could pull the actual question as a matter of fact, from the Discord. Uh, let's see, sometimes Discord moves slow on my computer. And if it's taking too long to move there, I'll, I'll just talk without, uh, without the accuracy of reading what I actually said. But I prefer to read what I said. And what I said was, I don't know, so uh, I posted if Van Sertema was wrong, and that Africans did not come before Columbus, should we as Africans ourselves promote his error? Uh, only to say from the pro-black perspective came through and he says, I don't know if he was wrong, I think he was exaggerated later, and I agree with that. And in fact, I replied, I don't, I don't know that he was wrong either. I personally think he was exaggerated to be discredited. That said though, if evidence came along suggesting he was in fact wrong, should we be highlighting the fact as well? And I added this part and I stand by this. White folks say a bunch of shit that can be debunked, but they don't correct shit because they know it works to indoctrinate their people. 
I was having this conversation with Azuliism just the other day. Okay? These guys don't retract shit. They don't apologize for, for some shit they said. They just, just carry on. So why do we feel the need to debunk, right? To debunk and promote the fact that we've debunked the air. And I get, listen, I'm not out here suggesting wild uh, conspiracies and theories and whatnot be pushed out there. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that, like, like Yakub and all that old shit. I'm not saying that. But I am saying, right, that we should, we should play the same game that other folks are playing. Why are we the moral uh, cornerstone of society? Right? So that's why I want to read this tonight. Uh, last point I'll make is to this last sentence. For example, the matriarchal family with the spirit of mother dominating was considered inferior to other cultures. Now, I mentioned this on the show before and I got some pushback that black society doesn't live in a matriarchal or matrilineal um, way. And I mean, it's just obvious that we do. And we have been doing it uh, in varying degrees from the days back on the continent, right? If you look at Europeans, Europeans talk about the fatherland. Go back in recent European writings, and that's all they talk about is the fatherland. When they, when they refer, refer to their homeland, they refer to it as the fatherland. Africans call it the motherland. That's an interesting dichotomy, right? Two people referring to their homeland, one people typically says the fatherland, the other says the motherland. Something to think about. Uh, I see that uh, NYC Beauties is here, New York Sports Archives is here saying greetings to the family, greetings to them. Thanks for joining us tonight, much appreciated. All right, to continue, to dispose of this ideological dogma, Jope used a two-pronged attack. First, the quote-unquote monogenetic theory of humanity, and second, the two-cradle theory. The monogenetic theory simply stated the following. We are able, quote, we are able to say scientifically today with certainty that mankind was born in Africa, within the region of Kenya, and around the areas that comprise Ethiopia, that, that comprises, sorry, Ethiopia and Tanzania dispersing along a north-south axis all the way to South Africa. Presently, paleoanthropology has for the most part come to embrace the monogenetic theory of humanity. Through the study of bones, tools, and DNA, the out-of-Africa theory or, or, or African Eve theory has taken center stage as opposed to the ideologically based multi-regional theory on the origin of humanity. Although the out of Africa theory has gained acceptance, there has been profound silence on the clear co uh, corollary aspects of such a pronouncement, namely uh, considering that mankind developed in Africa and that this first mankind was black skinned. Blacks had to be at the origin of the world's first civilization. The confirmation of Southeast Africa as the origin of humanity allowed Job to pose the question of the peopling of ancient Egypt from an entirely new perspective. This new perspective emerges from two important facts. One, humankind born around the Great Lakes region, almost on the equator, is necessarily pigmented and black. The Gloga law calls for warm-blooded animals to be pigmented in a hot and human, humid climate. Two, all other races derived from the black race by more or less uh, affiliations and other continents were populated from Africa at the Homo erectus and Homo sapiens stage 
150,000 years ago. The old theories that used to state blacks came from somewhere else are now invalid. The information leads to the logical conclusion that from the upper Paleolithic period, these black men and women migrated from inner or central Africa, populating the Nile Valley through the dynastic uh, epoch. Current Paleoarchaeological evidence has been bolstered, has even bolstered Job's theory by demonstrating that there exists in East Central Africa an advanced culture some 70,000 years ago, whereas similar cultures did not appear outside Africa until some 54,000 years later. This new information puts aside the idea of an Asian or Delta origin of Comitic civilization. There are several competing theories that are bandied about rather than one attempt to explain the evolution of civilization. They range from the race hypothesis, environmental determinism, internal conflict, external conflict, hydraulic managerial integrative, social integration, to, unil to unilinear evolution. The primary focus of most of these theories is state formation. However, the unilinear evolution theory posited by Henry Morgan in 1908 in ancient societies uses culture as its driving force. Morgan theorized that culture drives itself forward as specific inventions are made, such as fire, pottery, writing, iron, and so on. Without these successive inventions, cultures become stuck in a stage of savagery or barbarism. Who do you think was stuck in that for a long time? The cultures that continue to progress through these successive stages ultimately reach the final stage, civilization. A key criterion used by Morgan to distinguish civilization from barbarism, uh, sorry, from barbarism was the patriarchal or patrilineal family. Huh, that's interesting. The unilineal aspects of Morgan's theory is that all cultures form origin from, from origin to present have passed through these stages. And these stages are lower savagery, middle savagery, upper savagery, lower barbarism, uh, sorry, barbarism, and upper barbarism. Why do I keep saying barbarianism? Uh, you know, upper barbarism to, 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 to civilization. Highlight that. Morgan's criteria were presented as linear and sequential, and by implication, if you examined a culture that practiced matrilineal social organization, you have in fact observed a culture of people still in their savage, barbaric state. Let me read that again. Morgan's criteria were presented as linear and sequential, and by implication, if you examine a culture that practice matrilineal social organization, you have in fact observed a culture or people still in a savage, barbaric state. Isn't that funny? To say? Isn't that funny? Right? Isn't that funny? As a counter to the work of Morgan. Bachofen and Engels, uh, shake on to Job, presented his own hypothesis, which he called the two cradle theory. Job in 1978 states, in fact, if it were proved contrary to the generally accepted theory that insisted of a universal transition from matriarchy to patriarchy, humanity has from the beginning been divided into two geographical, dis geographical distinct cradles, one which was favorable to the flourishing of matriarchy and the other to that of patriarchy. And these two systems encountered one another and even disputed with each other in different human societies, that in certain places they were superimposed on, on each other or even existed side by side. The term cradle has several definitions that Choke clearly envisioned as the basis to formulate his hypothesis. The most common definition of cradle is a baby small bed, 
Also, a cradle is known as a place of things beginning. In any case, the word cradle is, in almost all cases, associated with infancy, and also a place where an infant spends a great deal of time in his or her formative years. Therefore, cradle, in this case, is a metaphor for environment, one labeled northern and the other southern. The two cradles exist side by side or are imposed on one another. Job label, labels these areas as zones of confluence. All right, so that that is the definition for what the northern is, southern, right, and the zones of confluence. In the chat room, I see we got Dorico Cooper Photography here saying, "Peace, family." Uh, finally caught a Thursday live. Good for you, man. Glad to have you here. Uh, Kevin Carefoy too says, "Abundance to all." Black Excellence says, "Hello, all." Hello to all of you. Hello to all of you. Uh, you guys make sure hit the hit the like button and you know, funny enough we seem to have more likes and viewers today um, but if you haven't hit the like button please do as a consequence it will be impossible for these two different cradles of humanity the northern cradle located around the Eurasian steppes favorable to nomadic life and the southern cradle Africa in particular favorable to the sedentary our cultural life to produce the same political and social organization right i mean it just makes sense in fact if the patriarchal family and social organization was the highest and final stage of a sequential stage of the family as theorized by uh by Kofan, morgan and Engels, there should remain some vestiges of the earlier matriarchal family in the northern cradles mythology traditions and kinship terms job states quote as far as we go back in the indo-european past even so far back as the eurasian steeps there is only to be found the patrilineal genos with the system of uh consanguinity which at the present day uh, still characterize the descendants. I, I, I may have butchered a pronunciation there, forgive me, but that's how I am when I'm reading live. I, I may miss some words. In essence, each cradle produced a culture that was distinct with regard to its environmental demands and life needs. Job listed the characteristics of these two cradles to provide a clear comparison. What has become clearly important about these two cradles is the fact that they were not complementary to one another, but in fact were antagonistic. In fact, Hans Gunther, 1992 states, with Nordic conqueror's father, right spread itself over the regions about Mediterranean. With Nordic conqueror's father, right spread itself over the regions about Mediterranean. Who's writing this stuff? The evidence has shown that when nomadic pastoralist people have encountered sedentary agricultural people, the nomadic pastoralists have been installed as the, as the social elites. Wow. This brings us back to ancient Kemet and the two cradle theory, which states that if ancient Kemet had evolved as a patriarchal society, as some Egyptologists claim, it in fact would have remained patriarchal throughout its entire history and therefore be a part of the Northern Cradle. Also, if a dynastic race had entered Kemet and ignited their civilization, they would have had to have been nomadic and therefore patriarchal. In any case, there should be some evidence of patriarchy, particularly among the ruling families and social elites. Conversely, if there is sufficient evidence that matrilineal family and social organization were present at the emergence of Kemet and remain a strong element of Kemetic social organization throughout its history, then Kemet must be placed in the Southern Cradle as a black African civilization. Very few Egyptologists would argue that when Egypt emerged as a, as a civilization, its foundation rested on a sedentary lifestyle made up of small farms and villages. 
Although there is disagreement on the chronology of such events, there is less controversy that Namur Menes was the one who unified both Upper and Lower Kemet and moved the capital to the thinnest area near Abydos. By the Third Dynasty, the monarchy was institutionalized and all of the technological and cultural elements of what we know now as Kemet, uh, as Kemetic civilization were in place. These technological and cultural elements needed only to be passed on from generation to generation to perpetuate the Kemetic civilization. Egyptologists have recovered two key pieces of uh, Hera Khan Polis, right, that referred to Nama, the Nama Palit, and the Nama Mesehead. The Palit is the earliest historical record from an ancient, from, 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 from ancient Egypt, sorry. In his book, Chronicle of the Pharaohs, Peter Clayton in 94, 1994, describes a very important scene on the pilot. The frontal face of the goddess Hathor is a dominant aspect of both sides of the pilot and must surely have deep significance in such a prime position. Although Horus was the god of Neken, it may be presumed that the principal temple was dedicated to him. It is possible that he is shown on the pilot as a younger Horus, who was the son of Hathor, which would explain his mother's dominant role in Pilate's religious iconography. In the chat room, Revolutionary Matron says, if patriarch is the highest form of civilization, they would produce and maintain an ultra-violent society. Patriarchy cannot be the highest form of society. All right? What do you guys feel about revolutionary matron's comment there? If patriarchy is the highest form of civilization, they would produce and maintain an ultra-violent society. Patriarchy cannot be the highest form of society. What are you guys listening to me right now or in the playback what are your thoughts on that statement by revolutionary matron all right to continue on ancient kemet's earliest historical record we see the mother occupying a dominant role in the emerging civilization an archaeological find at helwan tomb corroborates the importance of women at the emergence of kemet Recovered at this site was an ivory plaque of Queen uh, Nithotep, Nithotep, right? Although Egyptologists debate whether she was the wife or mother of Namur or Hor Aha, her importance in the unification of Kemet is unquestioned. Hoffman remarks on her importance with the following statement, quote, whoever married whom the importance of Nithotep or Nithotep uh, at practically the moment of unification as already suggested parallels the historical position of Isabel of Castile and Leon. Still in the first dynasty, we have record of a queen reigning along with or as the regent for her young son. Mernes's tomb found at Abydos with a large stone grave, Stella, recorded her status and her title as king's mother. This reverence for women is not restricted to the royalty. We clearly see by titles of the old kingdom that women were key participants in all aspects of society. The first woman doctor in world history, Lady uh, Pezachet, is a product of ancient Kemetic social organization. In the Middle Kingdom, there is a continuation of the matrilineal family and social organization. After the collapse of the Middle Kingdom, ancient Kemet experienced what Egyptologists classify as the Second Intermediate Period. This period saw ancient Kemet occupied and ruled by a population from Lower Kemet called the Hyksos 
meaning rulers of foreign lands. The Hyksos were well organized. You peep, you, you peep the, the wording here, right? So Kemet Falls, right? Uh, goes into this period of, of, of being occupied by these folks who call themselves rulers of foreign land, which is wild to me, right? Now, when you describe these folks, the Hyksos, these rulers of foreign lands, right? What's the first thing they tell you when they describe these people? Well organized. Well equipped, warlike people who dominated the people of Kemet for at least 150 years. The key here is that they were well, they couldn't do it if they weren't well organized. Right? The Hyksos were Asiatic and had migrated into Kemet from the lands northeast of Kemet. Anytime I hear the term Asiatic, I think about, uh, I think about uh, these 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 NOI folks. These are uh, far kind of them, right? A the, the Asiatic peoples. Come on, guy. At the end of the 17th dynasty, the ancient Kemites began to fight a war of liberation to free themselves from the oppressive and alien rule of the Hyksos. This war of liberation against the Hyksos, led by rulers from the Theban Nome was finally completed by uh, Amos I, who began what was called the New Kingdom. A point to note is that after more than 150 years of foreign rule, the ancient Camites were very much interested in reestablishing their own culture. The New Kingdom undoubtedly reflects the matrilineal family and social organization that was present at the beginning of Kemetic civilization. This becomes clear by examining the ancestry of Amos the first. The ancestry of, of, of Amos can be found on a stella he erected at Abydos to commemorate the construction of a, cento, of, of, of a cenotaph for his mother's mother. Donald Redford in, uh, in 1967, in his work entitled History and Chronology of the 18th Dynasty of Egypt states, quote, in line eight of this text, the king in answer to his wife says, I have remembered the mother of my mother, the mother of my father, the great king's wife, king's mother, uh, Teti Sherry, uh, that Teddy Sherry represented the first generation of female line from which Amos or, or, or Amos uh, sprang is scarcely to be doubted. The purity of descent to which the queens of the 18th dynasty could lay claim continued throughout seven generations, at least from Teddy Sherry to uh, Hats Fetzot II and perhaps longer. Right. Considering that the families of the 17th and 18th dynasties had fought a war to free themselves of foreign rule and influence, it therefore flies in the face of rationality to conclude that these newly established dynasties would build their family organization to mirror a foreign institution or structure. Hmm. makes sense it is clear that they would not initiate or it was clear that they would not imitate the family organization of the Hyksos who were obviously nomadic patriarchal people see that that's the thing this is why you got to study history right this is why you have to study history if the Africans who Centuries after this period here, all right, millennia after this period that we're reading about right now, right? If those Africans who were gaining independence from the colonizers in the 60s had studied their history, right? 
uh, they had studied their history. They would have known better than to continue on the ways of the colonizers. Why is my phone blowing up right now? They would have known not to follow the oppressor's ways and to get back. I mean, full throated, wholeheartedly get back to their African ways. You see? If you don't study history, right, you're doomed. I'll, I'll just leave it full stop at that. If you don't study your history, you're doomed. But these folks, our ancestors here in this paper that we're reading about, once they beat the Hyksos up off of them, they didn't embrace the Hyksos way of life. They went back to organizing their family around matrilineal principles. The question I have though, and I, I don't know if I should ask it now or later. In fact, I'll, I'll ask it now. Something for the folks who are live with me tonight to chew on. Is the matrilineal family structure in today's world right in today's world where we have quote unquote white supremacy is the matrilineal family organization the way to go will that combat right this so-called whites this white supremacy uh supremacy idea that these fools have would that is that enough to combat it in this day and age I'll, I'll give you a hint in my thoughts i don't know if it works in this day and age but i'd like to hear from you guys in the chat room Rico cool photography says i ran to the store okay uh, okay uh, he goes on to say they consist of the factors of i ran to the store they worked as personal spies for Saddam. I'm lost here. I'm lost. I, I get the code, I guess. Uh, but I don't know the genesis of the conversation. So, Dorico, if you could clear that up for me, I'll appreciate it. All right. The organization of family around matrilineal principles is to be considered a reestablishment of authentic committed culture. And by the way, when I asked that question about the matrilineal uh, family organization, that I in no way have anything against women. I'm just asking, I'm just being a devil right now and asking, uh, you know, a question. To continue, in fact, the women in Kemet during this period exercised power in every capacity. Now, this is what I like to read about. Let's see how the women in Kemet exercised power, right? Redford in 1967 clearly illustrates this point when he states, quote, although the king was the real head of state and command in chief of the army, the queen stood surprisingly close to him in both of these departments. She was well informed on matters of state exercising considerable influence over the hair presumptive and presumably over her husband as well she even commanded her own body of troops hmm. nor did her influence decline with the passing of her husband the queen mother and the dowager queen retained their position of authority vis-a-vis -vis the son and the grandson and on the monuments are shown together with the king sometimes to the exclusion of the queen this, matri this matriarchal streak is one of the most striking features of the early 18th dynasty. By compartmentalizing ancient Kemet, Kemet in pseudo time periods, such as the old, middle, and new kingdoms, it appears that there was a matriarchal streak emerging in the new kingdom. Yet, when ancient Kemet is seen as one entire civilization that lasted more than 3,000 years. One can observe its clear cultural continuity. 
a key aspect of that cultural continuity is based on the matrilineal family and social organization. Right? Oh, I, I'm seeing some interesting com uh, comments or uh, responses to my question. I'll get to that in one moment, okay, guys? Uh, the relationship between Kemet and Nubia provides an excellent opportunity to study the social organization of ancient Kemet. Theo Theophile Obenga, in an article entitled Nubia and its relationship with Egypt, uh, the, the, with Egypt that, that appeared in UNESCO's History of Humanity, Volume 2, states two very important points about this relationship. One, from 1970 BC to 1785 BC, Egypt under the Sesso, the Sesso Strids was omnipresent in Nubia, as it was to be again from 1500 to 1100 BC under the rulers of the New Kingdom. On the other hand, during the 25th dynasty, it was the kings of Kush who established themselves in Egypt and ruled the country from 747 to 600, 656 BC. Two, it is difficult to know if the Nubians physically resemble their neighbors. Diodorus of Sicily made the following anthropological observation on some Ethiopians, quote, and particularly those living on the banks of the river, the Nile, had black skin, flat noses, and frizzy hair. Herodotus, the, quote, father of history, end of quote, had already noted that the uh, Egyptians had dark skin. These features would come within the province of physical anthropology, provide arguments for the view that Nubians and Pharaonic Egyptians were black Africans, like all, like all other black Africans of the continent. Sarah Gala, uh, Bantu, Yoruba, Mossi, Dogon, Wolof, Fulani, Malinke, Songhai, and so on, right? I emphasize these two points to show that there had been long contact between Kemet and Nubia, and that both the ancient Kemites and ancient Nubians were of the same race. In fact, there existed a Nubian Nile Valley cultural complex. However, according to scholars, the contact between Nubia an ancient Kemet in the New Kingdom resulted in a complete Egyptianization of Nubia. Quote, we have already seen that temples were built all over Nubia by the kings of the 18th and 19th dynasties. Then towns uh, important, then towns important as religious, commercial, and administrative centers grew around those temples. Nubia was entirely reorganized or purely, or purely Egyptian lines and a completely Egyptian system of, a, of administration was set up, entailing the presence of a considerable number of Egyptian scribes, priests, soldiers, and artisans. The Egyptianization of Nubia must be reflected in its social organization of the family. It stands to reason that of the ancient Nubian family was organized matrilineally, and so was that of ancient Kemet. This position is also stated by Redford, 1967, when he says, coming now within the geographical sphere of Egypt's influence, we find matriarchal tendencies strong in Nubia and Kush from ancient through modern times, at least in the ruling families. The queen mother in the royal house of 7th century Napata held a dominant and respected position. The passage of time did nothing but enhance the power of this member of the family. By the time the kingdom of Moreau, the matrilineal descent of the heir designate was apparently the rule and not infrequently a succession of queens found occupying the, Mar the, the Marotic thrones for long periods, right? Interesting. Uh, in the chat room, there's some comments based on the question I asked. And uh, I will address them right after this station ID.
great. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Make sure also check out the Queen's Council podcast as well. Uh, you know, as I'm as I did that station I break, it just dawned on me. Let me ask the chat room. You know, who's live with me? And if you listen to this in playback, you could also participate in answering this question. If you've listened to the other shows on KWAZ Radio, to any one of them, uh type hit hit one in the chat room for me. If you've listened to any of the other shows on KWAZ Radio, hit one in the chat for me. I'd just like to know if folks are also tuning in to those shows as well. Uh, Revolutionary Matron said, matrilineal structures only work if you have esteemed women. Ah. Ah, my uh, Revolutionary Matron. I, I don't know if you caught some episodes I did in the in the past, during the pandemic, where I talked about, um, you know, the character of of Afrocentric women. I don't know if you caught that, but uh, that's a, that's an episode you might want to listen to if you haven't already. Um, I also talked about in the past. I talked about Marcus Garvey's wife. I mean, these are esteemed women. Amy Jacks Garvey, esteemed women, right? Uh, so I, I fully agree with what you just said just now, right? Uh, the Rico Coop of Tory says no, because it's still backed by Urugu men. The system empowers women by undermining the leadership and authority of the black man. Hmm. So, you guys probably can figure this out. Um, I am a huge supporter, huge lover of black women. But I do feel black women, and of course black men, but I feel black women need to change up a bit. I think black women are, 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 are following white women to a certain extent. And I think there's this thinking of, you know, I think there's this, this, this thinking of we can do any and everything that our, our men do. And that's not really uh, the purpose. Uh, only to I say from the pro-black perspective, wrote a nice, a, a nice part of an essay. I, I, I don't remember if he completed that or not. But it was pretty cool. It was, it was about the the nature of men and and women. Like, you know, black men are, pr- are primary uh, protectors, secondary healers, and the women are the reverse: the primary healer, secondary protector. But I think we have a time in our history right now where our women are not doing what they're supposed to and of course uh, our men are on some bullshit too right but we can't have both on bullshit you know what i mean uh revolutionary matron goes on to say women that are community oriented and clear about the objective wise women are a treasure and to be honored matrilineal means that women co-rule and are not ruled over everyone plays their part that's exactly the point i was trying to make that's exactly the point I was trying to make. Uh, we cannot have this thing where both agendas are just on the dumb shit. We'll never go anywhere as a people. And we can't, as uh, men, we cannot be so whatless that we leave it all up to the women to do. All right? 
but this is why like in things like the, the podcast that i'm doing right now i love to see when women are participant so it, it, i'm happy to see revolutionary matron and life with nelly and daily affirmations by pauline and uh joni rosenthal and uh, and uh and, and and others right whom i pass through um you know sister nefere as well so i i'm always happy and that's why on the discord if you haven't joined the discord click the link join the discord today that's why i have like a, a area for women just to commune and i hope to make it bigger and i hope that you women who are involved on the discord already i hope you invite people you know who are conscious uh women and let's let's raise the consciousness of our women let's raise the consciousness of our children by way of our women you know uh i also did an episode a couple months ago during the pandemic that talks about the uh black women as teachers the basically the the portal to consciousness in the community so you know things like that you guys should check out as well uh revolutionary matron sorry dorico cool photography says camp ashraf camp ashraf i don't know what camp ashraf is let me see if i could pull up something real quick uh camp ashraf was a camp in Iraq's Diyala, uh, Diyala Governate, having the character of a small city with all basic infrastructure and headquarters of the exiled people's uh, Muhadin of Iran. The population used to be around 3,400 in 2012, but in 2013, nearly all were relocated to Camp Liberty near Baghdad International Airport after pressure by then Prime Minister Nori al-Maliki's office. So I'm not sure the reference in this conversation, but okay. Uh, Revolutionary Matron goes on to say women are given birth and usually better nurturers and better at setting the home environment. Men protect and are the warriors. This understanding is the basis for the Kenya behavior studies. Uh, Revolutionary Matron, can you tell us a little bit more about the Kenya behavior studies, if you don't mind? You know, just a little short something, let us know more. Revolutionary Matron typed one, the Rico Cooper Photography type one, when I asked if you were checking out other uh, shows on KWAZ Radio, I appreciate the fact that you guys do that. Uh, Rev- uh, the Rico Cooper Photography says to Revolutionary Matron, she says she's on point. But that type of woman you speak of is not the mindset of the majority of women today in the West. That would be ideal. I agree. That would be ideal. Ah, Dorico Cooper Photography says that city that I talked about was run by women. Okay, that's the connection. That city was run by women. Okay. Okay. Right. To continue with the paper, uh, Redford seems to think that Nubian, that Nubia somehow moved into Kemet's geographical space. What he obviously means is that Nubia came under the cultural influence of Kemet, which implies that ancient Kemet clearly was matriarchal, and the Kemites passed this type of family and social organization onto, uh, onto Nubia, Kush, and Moreau. All had the practice of matrilineal family and social organization as a result of the evolution in the southern cradle of Africa, or since time immemorial. And the Kushites installed themselves as the rulers of ancient Kemet during the 25th dynasty. They saw themselves as restorers of Kemet's ancient tradition. Shabako, the first sovereign of the 25th dynasty of Egypt, known as the Ethiopian dynasty, which also included Shabataka, uh, Taharka, undoubtedly the greatest sovereign of the dynasty, and Tunudamon, uh, it should be noted that royal succession was matrilineal. A Greek source, Nicholas of Damascus, specifically makes this point. Royal 
royal succession was matrilineal. Now, if you remember, I read another paper about this, where in other parts of Africa, we saw this as well. We saw that it wasn't uncommon for if a king died, it was his sister's son, not his son, but his sister's son was chosen to succeed, right? So that, so it shows that there, there's that influence, right? There's that matrilineal influence, right? She chose, she will choose which one of her sons will succeed her brother should he die, right? To continue, the schizophrenic dichotomous paradigm of European scholarship recognizes the matrilineal social structure of the Nubian Kush and Moreau, yet denies that it existed in ancient Kemet, although it is plainly stated that Nubia was thoroughly Egyptianized in all aspects of culture. I like how this writer put that just now. That's something you got to pay attention to. If you haven't read the work of Bobby E. Wright, Look back in the past, uh, I did a, me and, um, me and, um, Carl Hezekiah did the book review for Bobby E. Wright's, uh, seminal work. And, you know, these guys are crazy. These guys are crazy. Even, even in their history, even in their writing, right? These guys are schizo. Powerful women were a staple of comedic society. This is what this is what this is what revolutionary matron was talking about. Powerful women were a staple of comedic society. Four women ruled as pharaohs. Uh, uh, Nidocris in the sixth dynasty, uh, Sobnefru in the twelfth, Hashfet in the eighteenth, and. Uh, Twazret in the 19th, along with women such as Tai, Nefertiti, Ehotep, and Am Amosis uh, Nefertari. I'm reading like a, a primary school kid right now. All right. Uh, Nefertiti had an exceptional place in comedic history and wielded great influence in both political and religious arenas. Exhibitions of power like this by women could not have happened in a patriarchal society. Hmm. Hoffman, in Egypt before the Pharaohs, remarks, quote, precedents were already set by Nidotep and Merneith in the early first dynasty and continued in later years by strong women like Tedesheri and Hapshep. So, I guess, of the 18th dynasty. It is likely that such periodic reemergence of powerful women throughout Egyptian history reflect not only strong and opportunistic personalities, but the existence of certain underlying social rules or alternatives, such as matrilineal descent, which provided a convention sanction for the explicit political prominence of women in ancient Egypt. Hoffman's point is not to be taken lightly, for it is certain that women in other civilizations were as intelligent, creative, and determined as women in ancient Kemet. However, without social rules or alternatives, there existed no avenues or precedents for women to seek or exercise power. Yet in ancient Kemet, it is clear that women had access to status and power because of the matrilineal social organization of the family. Status and power. Right? Job selects the term Aryan to designate the people of the northern cradle. He explains this distinction in this manner. Quote, by Aryan, I was designating the early white inhabitants of what I call the northern cradle, that is, northern Europe. Within this context, the term Aryan is devoid of racist connotation given it by people such as Hitler. I mean the original white tribes of Northern Europe who spoke what is known as Indo-European languages and whose dispersal began after the second millennium BC. We know these original white populations as Aryan, 
The reason I use the term frequently in my works rather than the term Indo-European commonly used by European scholars is because Indo-European has a purely linguistic classification. The clarification between Aryan and Indo-European is crucial to understanding the clear context of Job's two cradle theory. First, because languages can be spoken by a variety of peoples, even by those who are classified as belonging to different races. And second, at the time when Job was writing the description, the Aryan was linked to a pure Nordic stock. Child, in 1926, provides us with a clear description of the Aryan model that Job discusses. Well, the great majority of investigators from uh, Omelius, Dihaloi, and Latham onwards, who have accepted the doctrine of a European cradle land, have located it somewhere on the Great Plains that extends from the North Sea to the Caspian. Not only does this region fulfill the condition postulated by linguistic uh, paleo, uh, paleontology better than others, it was also the area of characterization where tall blonde stock, the European race par excellence, was evolved. And all advocates of a cradle in Europe who have appealed to anthropological results at all have conceived the original Aryans as blondes. Although this description of the Aryans was once widely accepted, it has since been rejected by most scholars. When we examine the Northern Cradle, invariably we must confront the Indo-European question. The term Indo-European refers to a group of people linked by their linguistic classification. As to the origin of this people, uh, as to the origin to this group of people, a solution has yet to be found. Currently, there exist numerous theories with regard to their origin. Some scholars look to Asia for their homeland whereas other scholars theorize that Europe is indeed their homeland. Early in the 19th century, scholars looked to Asia as the homeland of the Indo-European, primarily because this theory was supported by the Bible, where Indo-Europeans were believed to be descendants of Japhet, a son of Noah. This superior race, primarily a pastoral people, migrated, spreading the gifts of civilization from Asia to Europe. You see, that's, this goes right back to that conversation that was had about Abrahamic religions. The primary way that scholars have reconstructed proto-Indo-European society is through linguistic evidence. What we can say for certain is that the Indo-Europeans were nomadic pastoral people. Linguistic evidence reveals that the Indo-Europeans only recognized three seasons, spring, winter, and summer. The implications of this evidence are spelled out by Vaughan Eyring in his work, Evolution of the Aryan. Just as the language of the Aryans possesses no expression for plow, so it has none for autumn. Of the seasons, it distinguishes only summer, summer, and winter, hema. Autumn has no meaning to the shepherd. The introduction of the word for autumn is a sure sign of the introduction of agriculture. Its absence with the people of such uh, cultivated speech as the Aryans is an equally sure sign of a mere shepherd life. Yeah, it's funny how you could... It's real funny how... And I'm thankful that humans have been able to do this. But it's real funny when you study language, right? You can trace a history just through language. And I like what they did here. I mean, look, if you don't have the word for plow, a word for autumn, right? What kind of people must have you been, right? What kind of people have you been historic? Right? It's the same thing I talked about, I think it was in the last episode, all the words in Nigeria that are similar to terms in Japan, now is there some genetic link? I'm not sure, right? But don't tell me that a town is named so and such, and you and you, you know, three four towns in Nigeria, three four cities or or have you Nigeria is named so and such, and y'all got three or four uh, similarly named, if not exactly named towns, 
right? In Japan. It, it, it's very interesting what you could learn if you study language, right? To continue, the horse was also a fundamental part of Indo-European society. So much so that their house, a wagon, was considered a movable possession. Huh. When we examine the family in Indo-European society, all evidence demonstrates that the family and social organization was strictly patriarchal. According to Emil Benveniste, author of the Indo-European Language and Society, quote, Latin has three adjectives derived from pater. Only one is Indo-European. This is patrius, which in fact goes back to uh, to p to to so it goes back to pater in its most ancient and classificatory sense, right? We know there was not and could not have been a corresponding matrius, right? Sometimes these papers are written funny. Um, by the way, if you, if you guys ever want these papers, by all means, just hit me up. I have no problem sending them to you if you want these papers. In short, in Proto-Indo-European language, there exists a term for father, but there is not and could not have been a corresponding term for mother. Remember what I said earlier? You talk to these, these, uh, these Europeans, and they, they call their homeland the fatherland. You talk to an African, and it's motherland. And this is an interesting point. These guys had the word for father, and didn't have a term for mother. Which goes to show you again how Europeans didn't really give, don't really give a shit about women. This information demonstrates that the hypothesis of Morgan, Befault, uh, Bakofen, and Engels that say that all societies pass through an early archaic stage of matriarchy are groundless. Child states, a very large number of sociologists contend that the system of reckoning descent through the female has everywhere and always preceded the more familiar patrilineal system of uterine uh, kinship. The Indo European language reveals no trace. Head up one more time. Of uterine kinship, the Indo European language reveals no trace. The Aryan name for kindred is exceptionally widely diffused and preserves a remarkable uniformity of meaning in all linguistics groups. They all without exception refer to agnatic relationships. We are then warranted in inferring that the Aryan family was patrilineal and patriarchal. patriarchal. In this type of family and social organization, the woman, when married, had to provide a dowry or gift to live in the house of her husband. <laughs> oh, boy. The wife becomes a piece of property, along with other property that the husband possesses, such as his weapon, his horse, his bondman, and so on. This was so much the state of affairs in ancient times that at the husband's death, the wife was required to mount a stake and be burned alive. Widow burning. And y'all telling me we, we want to follow these folks? Y'all telling me black men are the white men of black society? Jamel Hill? Black men, that's what this lady said. Black men are the white men of black society. But read what I'm, let's go through this again, right? I think this paragraph is important. In this type of family and social structure, the woman when married had to provide a dowry or gift to live in the house of her husband. The wife becomes a piece of property along with other property that the husband possesses, such as his weapon, his horse, his bondman, and so on. This was so much to say of affairs in ancient times 
that at the husband's death, the wife was required to mount a stake and be burned alive. Now, if I'm reading that correctly, she had to build the shit up for them to burn her alive. It's called widow burning. Surely in this type of society, the birth of a daughter was not greeted with happiness. We know about the Asians and, and, and their practices with uh, girl children who were born. They tossed them over a mountain, over a cliff, to their death. As Vaughn Iring reports, only the son was received at birth with joy, the daughter with repugnance. Daughters are a sorrow. Sons are the father's pride and glory. Now, later on, these Europeans flipped the switch on that. They switched that up later on. Uh, I've talked about that in the show in the past, right? But later on, they will switch that up somewhat for economic gain, all right? It is clear that Proto-Indo-European society was patriarchal and women were relegated to property status. Moreover, the status of women in European society changed little from antiquity until the 18th century, right? That's when they, that's when they switched it up. The protoculture located in the zone of confluence that is clearly distinguishable is that of Mesopotamia. The history of Mesopotamia covers a period of some 3,000 years. Its key centers are Sumer, Akkad, Babylon, and Assyria and are as diverse as the geography and the people of Mesopotamia. The environment that gave birth to this civilization was rough and harsh. The Tigris and Euphrates were violent and unpredictable forces of nature that made life tenuous. Mm, I gotta read more about that. The Sumerians who laid the cultural foundation for Mesopotamia, Mesopotamian civilization were farmers and city builders farmers and city builders. Evidence seems to imply that the women of Sumer were held in high esteem and the family was organized in a matrilineal structure. However, as the Sumerians came in contact with and were conquered by nomadic Semitic people, the status of women changed considerably. Our best knowledge of social conditions in Mesopotamia is taken from the various recorded law codes. There exists primarily three law codes. The first is from near the town of Eshuna, 1800 BCE. The second is that of the code of Hammurabi, 1700 BCE. And the third is from Assyrian scribes in 1100 BCE, All right? The most famous record and clearest declaration of the status of women comes from the code of, Hama, of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was known as a just king whose primary goal was to regulate the social relations of his people. One of the statuettes of the code of Hammurabi states, quote, if an obligation came due against a free man and he sold the services of his wife, his son or his daughter, or he was, or he has been bound over the service, they shall work in the house of their purchaser or oblige for three years with their freedom reestablished in the fourth, right? If an obligation came due against a free man, okay, and he sold the services of his wife, his son or his daughter, or he has been bound over the service himself, they shall work in the house for their purchaser or obliged for three years with their freedom established in the fourth. Right? So this is why I always say there was always some form of slavery, but you had the ability, right, to, to get out of it. It was a certain amount of time, right? I see in the chat room there's some uh, movements. Let's go back up. Revolutionary Matron said the two-year, $600,000 program says expectations of Kenyan men, quote, to be tough, heterosexual, aggressive, 
unemotional and achieving this was funded by the government so this is revolutionary matron's answer to my earlier question um this was in response to my earlier question of something she posted now i can't find it uh Yeah, earlier, Revolution Major said women are giving birth and are usually better nurturers and better at setting the home environment. Men protect and are the warriors. This understanding is the basis for the Kenya behavior study. So that, uh, so when she explained it, she explained that the Kenya study is a two-year, 600K uh, dollar program right with it that says expectations of kenyan men to be tough heterosexual aggressive unemotional and achieving and that was funded by the government okay so that's the answer to that uh Derico Cooper photography says ghana has a strong matriarchal society as well that is why monsanto and bg spend so much time in kenya is that true they, i didn't know that they spent a lot of time in kenya uh Revolutionary Matron says to Dorico Cooper Photography, we are going to have to convert th them and may have to birth them. That's a, that's a fact. We have to, and this is why the education is so important. We got to get our, our youth, male and female, under the right education so that they could learn what it is that's needed of them, that's needed of them as men and women. And those needs may overlap in some places, but for the most part, those the needs are two different needs because these are two complementary uh, genders, right? Rico Cooper Photography says that is why China is so buy out is so buy out there as well as buying buying up all the infrastructure to include their ports, etc. Uh, Dorigo says the revolutionary matron, but first we have to get these women to allow good men to see their children rather than trying to max out on child support. Revolutionary matron says facts. Dorigo Cooper Tarvi says, I have never been to Kenya. I think it would be healthy for me to live there at least for a few years. I agree. I agree with that. It would be healthy for our young men to have you know, it's one of the things that we're really missing in black society. We don't have those right to abode programs like these Uwish have, where in the summertime they send their kids uh, back to to their homeland to indoctrinate them a little further. You know, uh, if you grew up back in their homeland, when you hit a certain age, you have to join the military, right? You have to join the military for a certain amount of time. But we are missing those kind of kinds of rites of passages. And a place like Kenya with a with that type of development going on should be welcoming our African children to come and spend time, you know, at least a summer, a few weeks, you know. Uh Revolutionary Matron says women are an object to Europe, a group member to Asians. And, and equal to Africans. They have a classification for Indians, but since the woman is God in African culture, I add the indigenous as African. Uh, Dorico says, facts, check out leftover women of China. I think he was referring to when I was talking about the fact that the Chinese have a history of tossing the female uh, newborns over a cliff. Dorico goes on to say the average Kenyan woman has six children. BG and Monsanto are trying to put a stop to that. Mm. Right? Dorico Fotari says rites of passage. Absolutely. We're missing that rites of passage. Right? I appreciate those comments, man. Keep them coming. I like I like that type of stuff. Uh the code of Hammurabi demonstrate that women and children were considered property and could be sold or leased by the husband to repay a debt. Similarly, in the case where a woman is the victim of rape, 
the crime was seen more in terms of a property crime than a moral outrage. But I see you, you Negroes out here like Mark Lemoyce Hill and stuff talking about black folks have a rape culture. You see, and this is the problem I have too. Mark Lamont Hill is supposed, I'm not wishing no ultimate harm, but he's supposed to get his ass kicked for that. We supposed to be able to tune into a YouTube video and watch him get dressed down and get his ass kicked for that. He said that during the Uma interview, right? The other thing with Mark Lemoy Hill I don't like, Mark Lemoy Hill is so deep up a Palestinian's backside, it's not funny. I saw a clip yesterday, I think it was, where Lemoyce was telling black folks, you should care about the Palestinians. And he went through it, and the, the, the last point he made was like, you should care just because it's the moral thing to do. Why isn't Lemoyce talking about Palestinian anti-blackness? But I digress. But this is how these folks treat their, treat their wives, treat their children. And by the way, you folks who take up these, these men, right? All women who take up these men, right? All women who are mothers already, who take up these men and make them stepfathers to uh, little black boys and little black girls, don't read. If you understand the history of these folks, you wouldn't do that. I always think of the example of the um, Chico de Bajanem. Chico de Bajanem had a, had a French, I think he's a French, I think, I think he was French, French father. He had de Baj, right? Had a French father and he was molesting his children. That's why a lot of them were, were dope heads. The trauma of being molested by their white father, man. These guys have a history in them of this type of shit. And if you read this last paragraph and you apply it to the Debaj family, that white boy who was their father probably felt like well, it was his property. He could do with it whatever he will, uh, you know, what, what, whatever he chooses. That's why I'll, I'll tell you something. I, I don't like to see, uh, I don't like to see interracial couples for the most part. Uh, I particularly hate to see a black woman with a white guy. I particularly hate because I know the history that women were basically property. They were neither to be seen nor heard. Women are always under the control of a male. Until the time of her marriage, a girl remained under the protection of her father. Once married, she was under the control of her husband. During the marriage ceremony, a free woman assumed a veil which she wore from, wore from then on outside her home. In fact, the veil was the mark of a free woman. Other than tavern keepers, the only other occupations for women mentioned in the law codes were as priestesses and prostitutes. Even the wives of the king were not important enough to be regarded as queens. The chief wife was instead usually called she of the palace, quote unquote, she of the palace, and lived along with other concubines and other wives in a harem guarded by eunuchs. My nose messed up to laugh, but when I think about harems, Got it by Unix. That's the funniest shit to me. I don't know why that is. That is the funniest shit to me. Right? The family of Mesopotamia was strictly a patriarchal, with decent with descent being recognized patrilineally. In the family structure, the man was called Bella or Master. The man was also known as the Bell Ash Shatim the wife's master, and as head of the household, depending on his disposition, he punished or pardoned her behavior. In Assyria, in the second millennium, the husband had the right to beat his wife, whip her, pull her hair out, bruise her, or injure her as he wished. If she was known to be adulterous, he could kill her.
Mm. Contemporary societies of ancient Kemet, Mesopotamia, exhibit distinct forms of social organization, one being patrilineal, Mesopotamia, and the other being matrilineal, ancient Kemet. This point is made clear by Henry Frankfurt, 1956, quote, for a comparison between Egypt and Mesopotamia discloses not only the writing, representational art, monumental architecture, and a new kind of political coherence were introduced in the two countries. It also reveals the striking fact that the purpose of their writing, the contents of their representations, the functions of the monumental buildings, and the structure of the new societies differed completely. What we observe is not merely the establishment of civilized life, but the emergence concretely of the distinctive forms of Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilization. What is evident is that ancient Kemet cannot be considered a Semitic society, and the status and treatment of women only highlight this reality. This is not a major problem among specialists, yet it becomes problematic when modern day Arabs in Egypt, for tourist purposes, lay claim to the black African Egypt of antiquity. Man, if you know, well, you guys know, I've talked about it before. If you know how much that bothers me, if you know how much that bothers me, examining the protocultures of three distinct civilizations in antiquity clearly il illustrates Sheikh Ante Job's two cradle theory. The picture of the anterior civilizations allows the evidence to point out which current and subsequent societies can be traced back to these protocultures. For example, it is evident that Greece and Rome and families and, and social organization emerged from a proto-Indo-European culture. As well, the proto-culture in Mesopotamia gave birth to subsequent Semitic civilizations in the Semitic world, that is Babylon, Assyria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. Likewise, when ancient Kemet is examined as a proto-culture, it is apparent that ancient Kemet gave birth to subsequent black African societies, such as Nubia, Kush, Moro, and ancient Ghana. So, someone mentioned Ghana earlier. The article operationalizes the term civilization as the highest cultural grouping of a people and the broadest level of cultural identity. It is defined by common objective elements, such as language, history, religion, customs, institutions, and the subjective self-identification of people. The definition was chosen from the text entitled The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order with a practical purpose because the author Samuel P. Huntington in 1996 is a conservative political theorist who states that most scholars of civilization do not recognize a distinct African civilization. By using Huntington's 1996 criteria, we can place ancient Kemet as the originator of the protoculture of black African civilizations. Geography, Kemet is located in Northern Africa. Language, ancient Kemetic language is genetically linked to black African languages. History, shared. Religion, spiritually based. Customs, uh, divine kinship. Matriarchy. Uh, Totemism, cosmo, cosmogony, ancestor worship, subjective self-identification. Uh, yeah, so under subjective self-identification, iconographic evidence demonstrates that the ancient Kemites identified themselves with the rest of Black Africa. So this last part I just read is like a, it's like a character sketch right of kemet showing its extension right into other black african civilizations right we, fact kemet is located in africa fact ancient kemet uh kemetic language is genetically linked to black african languages uh what's the book that talks about that in depth what is the book? I can't remember the name now. Do you guys remember the name of the book that talks about the relationship between the Kemetic languages and and languages throughout uh, uh, Black Africa? History shared, religion spiritually based. 
We are a spiritual people, not religious. Customs are divine, ki divine kingship, sorry. Matriarchy. Totemism. Cos cosmogony. Ancestor worship. That's our customs. All right? Across Africa, and this comes from uh, our, our, our link to Kemet. Right? Our subjective self-identification, iconographic evidence, demonstrates that the ancient Kemites identified themselves with the rest of Black Africa. And that's the paper. That's the paper. What do you guys think of the paper? Let me know what, what, what your thoughts are on the paper. I know there's some comments in the chat. I'll be back to uh, engage with those comments on the other side of this station ID. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed, we're back. We just finished reading this paper. Let me hit up the comment section before I leave. Um, I enjoyed the paper personally. Uh, and so I hope you guys did too. Um, in the chat room, Revolutionary Matron says, no one has acted morally towards black people. We owe them nothing, not a goddamn. I shall lie. Rikukupatari says that rape culture is forced upon us by Urugu with BDSM, which has its roots in slavery. Revolutionary Matron says a DuPont molested his own three-year-old daughter. Yeah, what happened to that? The wife stayed and did not address the issue until she filed for divorce. Whatever became of that DuPont situation? That's right, I forgot about that. Rico Cooper Vittori says women that have been treated in that manner early on tend to seek out men that enjoy sadomasochism. Ma if you don't get down like that, they will leave you for one that does. That's an absolute fact. Right? A lot of that. And, and so, one of the reasons why I, I particularly, and I dislike all of them, one of the reasons why I particularly dislike to see white men with black women. I know how white men get down, and it's just what Dorico Cooper just stated in the chat. Listen, there's a whole area of pornography. I don't know if it's still around, but it was around for a long time. That ghetto guy does shit. Well, white dudes doing all kind of nasty spitting in black women's mouths and smutting them out and all that kind of stuff. That's their get down. I can't stand to see it. Rico also says to revolutionary uh, matron, black people don't owe anyone anything but an ass whooper. Yep, that's Dr. John Henrik Clark. Revolutionary matron says no jail time. He needed therapy and support. So that's what happened to that DuPont guy, huh? He got therapy and support. That's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. You get these guys around you, man. Your children who are defense, because they don't have no problem taking advantage of the defenseless. That's how they get down. In fact, the more defenseless you are, the happier they are. You get these guys around your children and stuff like that, and I don't care if it's even children, they help create. These guys will take advantage of your children. That's a fact. That's historically true. And I, I tell black people all the time, if these guys were this way to their own people, their own women, their own children, what do you think they have in store for your black eyes? Nothing but the worst. Nothing but the worst. Anyway, y'all, that's my time. I appreciate you guys who are here live with me. It seems like there was more people listening live than... Uh, Seems like there was more people listening live 
then uh participated in the chat uh that's that's cool though uh once you guys are happy once you guys get something out of the reading uh i'm happy with that revolution matron says hit me on the discord if you want to talk okay uh she also says they are studying the kenya males to find out how to destroy our warriors i believe that i believe that right so that's the paper uh hope you guys enjoyed the paper uh make sure follow kwaz radio on youtube if you haven't done so already make sure follow kwaz radio on youtube um we're looking for a volunteer or two to help us with the kwaz radio channel which will of course be used to promote all the shows on kwaz radio as well as to um attract others who have who have similar uh you know similar stances to those of us on kwaz radio so uh you know if you want to help us with that channel uh just let me know in the discord and we'll go from there i see kw don seven has retained his unbroken uh streak right he's here again saying checking in late i appreciate you for checking in uh hopefully you enjoyed the uh, hopefully you enjoyed the paper if not if you haven't been able to to hear all of it hopefully you will enjoy it when you finish listening to the episode okay that's my time guys i'll be on the discord actually for a little bit i'm gonna hop on the discord now for a little bit um i'll be in the voice chat if you wanna if you want to talk to me or something like that or if you want to talk to me privately hit me a dm on the discord if you're not on the discord of course click the link in the description or or at the top of the chat and join the discord today all right thanks again everyone for being here i'll be back on saturday shoot the breeze i see some of you have been posting shoot the breeze topics already i appreciate you i'll see you guys on saturday peace thanks for listening to the beta medicine podcast with your host Koku. if you like what you just heard we hope you pass along our web address betamedicineblogs.com to your friends and colleagues and share our show to all your social media be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts this has been a kwaz radio production join us next time for another session of the beta medicine podcast follow us on facebook at beta medicine show twitter beta meds tumblr beta meds instagram beta medicine